Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry for the delay. <laughs> we had staff meeting this morning and I was just working away on something for the the email this week and I looked up and I went, ah! so, so I'm a little, a little flurried this morning or this afternoon. So welcome in. Um, if you don't have your Bible handy, go grab it and turn to uh, Genesis in the 24th chapter. Bring your pencil or highlighter or whatever you use for making your notations um, and we will get started. So Let's start, as we always do, with a word of thanksgiving and prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of this time together, these people who are gathered to listen to your word and to think about some things that are troubling to us and, and that just give us all kinds of joy. So we thank you for the story of your people and, uh, and the story that begins our story with you. We thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for each other. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, Akara. Good to see you hosted. Good to have you with us. Um, I got a really good question. Let me get my phone. I got a really good question from someone who, uh, from, who watches with us. Um, well, sometimes with us, but mostly afterwards. So we're on demand with her. Now I need to find her thing. Because I wanted to bring this question up because I think probably um, w you probably had some of the same questions and I thought I would address that a little bit further before we move on with today's reading. Um, the questions were, actually it was a statement but inside a question, disturbed by God instructing Abraham to send Hagar and Ishmael off into the wilderness. Sarah wanted it to happen. Abraham was conflicted and talked to God about it. God instructed him to do as Sarah requested. Ishmael, the father of the Muslim ethnicity, is as defined by the mother's ethnicity only. God supported Sarah in her desire to effectively build a wall that excluded another ethnicity instead of helping her to understand Isaac and Ishmael could coexist in the same land despite their diversity. It's one thing with Abraham by his own doing was one of it's one thing with Abraham by his own doing was one of the first slave owners. He's human, flawed, but this sending off a son of a different race was supported by God. Help me understand if this too is just Abraham again being a flawed person, or if God did support this action, what was the rationale? So a good topic for conversation and some thought and prayer. Um, one of the things that I think we need to always be aware of as we're looking, going through Old Testament is there is always an undercurrent of explanation for things that will happen in the future. Um, because you have to remember, um, we've talked before about we have the the time of the text, the story that's being told in time. So now, since we've been talking about Abraham and Sarah, we're talking about 2000 BC or before the common era. So 2000 years ago. So they lived about as far BC as we're living AD. So first of all, we have to look at that time in which the story unfolded. Then we also have to look at the influence of the time of the folks who gathered the stories and caused them to be written down. Uh, so which was obviously much further in the future. So um, I, I don't have a dating just in my head, but we've got then say, let's say 500 years later in the exile or um, some time, um, you know, just at a, at a certain point when these stories were put together, probably, probably more than a thousand years later, we have the influence of how people have started to think about things on the way the story is told. So there's an interpretive layer that comes from the author or the editor of the story and how it was written down. Um, and so we kind of need to keep those two things in, ten in tension. It's easier to talk about that when we talk about, we have the story of Jesus 
and when he was walking around on the earth in the 30s AD. But then we also have the interpretation of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John about that story. And those would have happened at the very earliest, a whole generation after Jesus was go gone from the earth, uh, who had after he had ascended. So we've got anywhere from 35 to 90 AD, people, these gospel writers who are putting down these stories with a layer of interpretation, cultural interpretation, as well as their own, uh, as, far, as far as literary sources and that sort of thing. So we have the world of the text, what really happened with, with Jesus, what was going on with Jesus. I don't want to say what really happened, but what was going on in the story as Jesus is telling it. And then we also have this layer of interpretation by the person who caused it to be written down. Same thing happens in the Old Testament. So, so when we think about that, and we think about that story of Abram and Sarah and Ishmael and Isaac, um, I, I don't think, Nikki, that, um, that what we are talking about is um, that God told Abraham um, that he was to send this child out into the wilderness to die. He did say that he would take care of him. So there wasn't a kind of a, a promise made between Abraham and God that his son Ishmael, who he loved, I'm sure, just as much as he loved Isaac, um, would be cared for in the desert. And indeed, that will be the case. I mean, the story that we get that we know the most is that Hagar gets sent out with Ishmael and then she puts him under a bush and goes away so that she doesn't have to watch him die. Um, but indeed, that is not what happens. But we don't hear that in the story that we hear. Um, that's the end of that story. And it picks up much later in Genesis. So, um, so in essence, basically, once again, God is saying, I'm going to go along with what you people have decided, you know, how you have chosen to be in this story. Um, but there are certain things that I will not allow. In other words, in this case, he would not allow that Ishmael would be, um, would die or would be destroyed in the wilderness because of Sarah's whim or Sarah's desire to keep Isaac as the sole heir. And I, at the time, <coughs> excuse me, I don't know that there was a lot of understanding about um, ethnicities and diversity the way we understand it today, because even though obviously there were some ethnicities that were um, that were not um, as as didn't have the same status or the same privilege or power that other eth ethnicities did, but part of that system is part of what the people of, excuse me the people of Israel actually did as they separated themselves from everyone else. And of course, that's what, you know, when the Jews became the holy people, the chosen people, to be made holy, to be holy, literally means to be set apart. So they were, you know, they stayed within their own tribes, they stayed within their own ethnic, ethnic groups. Uh, they were encouraged by God to keep themselves pure for this purpose in time. Uh, so, you know, we really are not in a position to question what God has done, because um, if we start questioning those kinds of things that appear to us to be unfair uh, by the action of God, then we're going to have to start questioning things like, well, what about salvation? That's a pretty unfair kind of thing um, that we get to receive the grace uh, for with no uh, no action on our own except believing. So we don't we can't earn grace, and that's not really fair. We should have to earn it, but we don't have to because that's what grace is. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, I know that that story is disturbing. It's almost as disturbing, you know, the same idea that you have with um, God asking Abraham or commanding Abraham to go and sacrifice Isaac. Uh, we have a similar kind of thing about why would God, the God that we know as the God of love, ask this man to sacrifice his child. Um, so in that case, the Isaac story is really meant as a foundation for what's going to happen to Jesus. And really, the doctrinal understandings of, of um, the crucifixion and, and how that um, apprehended our salvation, how that affected our salvation, 
Um, so to have this story of a man, a faithful person who was willing to give up his son in obedience to God, then we have that as an echo underneath the story of Jesus' death and crucifixion and resurrection. So um, I hope you're starting to see how, how these stories work and how they work together. I, I can remember in seminary, my Bible professors always talking about how consistent scripture was. And I heard that as it all agrees with itself, but that's not necessarily the case. There are some things where it does not agree with itself. Um, but the consistency comes in, you know, things that have happened, you know, centuries before something else happened. Then when the something else happens, there's all of this what I call echo, uh, all these layers of understanding and how culture has received and, um, and, and taken into their own story, um, all those things are still present when the event happens. So that's part of the consistency, the consistency of the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac and the story of God sacrificing his son um, they, in totally different um, testaments. And yet it is really, uh, those stories have a lot of similarity and a lot of themes in common. So that's my prelude for today. And if you have questions, I know uh, when we sit around the table back in the day, when we used to sit around the table and have these conversations, it was a lot easier to ask these kinds of questions. But if you have questions, uh, post them. And if they're simple questions, you know, we'll go ahead and I'll just answer them as I see them. But please feel free uh, to just send me an email and say I have you know a deeper question or it needs more explanation and then I will just go ahead and answer it the next time uh, we're together on Wednesdays at 1 online so that you you can get a, a better more thoughtful answer to questions you may have so but if you got little ones or just you know curiosity questions that you want to post please feel free I'll pick those up as I'm going along so I'm going to start reading at Genesis 24 if you will recall, um, Sarah has, Abraham and Sarah have grown to an old age. Um, they have settled in a land and Sarah dies and then a land is purchased for her, our cave is purchased for her burial and uh, in the field of Ephron in Machpelah to the east of Mamre, there was a field with a cave in it and that's where Sarah is buried. And as I mentioned last time, we have archeological evidence of, uh, of the existence of that cave um, I, I don't know that they found remains, but <laughs> that would have been really unusual. Um, so that was where Sarah was buried. So now we're going to move forward a generation. Um, Isaac has kind of grown up a little bit. So here we go in chapter 24. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his house, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that you will not get a wife from my son, for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live, but will go to my country and to my kindred and get a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth, and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land, he will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Um, okay, so there, if you have a I just want to stop there for just a minute. If you have a Lutheran study Bible, um, this is the first time I've ever seen this in print. This has always been kind of one of those things that I learned somewhere that I don't know why, but the idea of putting your hand under the thigh um, is that when an oath was sworn between two men, that putting the hand under the thigh placed the hand near the genitals 
or the source of fertility and life. So it was like on my life, basically, and on my the life of my future children, my future generations. Um, I, I swear this, I make this agreement with you and you swear to me. Uh, so that's kind of an unusual kind of thing. Um, and then this idea that Abraham has said to him, don't, don't take my son back there. Um, I do want you to go someplace else besides here the, and don't take a, 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 a woman for my son from the Canaanites where we live, but I want you to go home to my people and find a wife for him there. So here's something that also kind of kind of wrangles our modern cultural brains uh, when we talk about finding someone from the family to marry. I mean, that's there's laws against that now. So um, that is unusual. But that's also, think back to when we had the conversation about um, Adam and Eve, and then we had Cain and Abel, and then you know, they had children and Seth, and um, they had children, and everybody always asks, you know, who did, who did they have their children with? Did they have in, an incestuous relationship with Eve to have children? Or, you know, were there other people here that we just don't know the stories? And different scholars will answer that in different ways. But the whole idea of familial uh, connections to have children um, goes way, 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 way back. And so the morality of that was part of the way the people of the ancient world lived. Uh, today, we would look down upon that kind of choosing of a, of a wife, um, but it seemed to be the normal practice. And that, again, feeds into this idea of the people of Israel will keep themselves separate, will keep themselves holy, and will intermarry within their own tribe. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all kinds of choice gifts from his master. And he set out and went to Aram Naharim, to the city of Nahor. He made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water. It was toward evening, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, Please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master, Abraham. I am standing here by the spring of water, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. Let the girl to whom I shall say, please offer your jar that I may drink, and who shall say, drink, and I will water your camels, let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant, Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Before he had finished speaking, there was Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, coming out with her water jar on her shoulder. The girl was very fair to look upon, a virgin whom no man had known. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please, let me sip a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the water, excuse me, lowered her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw, and she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold nose ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing ten gold shekels and said, Tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, We have plenty of straw and fodder and a place to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the way to the house of my master's kin. 
Then the girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban, and Laban ran out to the man to the spring. As soon as he had seen the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms, and when he had heard the words of his sister Rebecca, thus the man spoke to me, he went to the man, and there he was standing by the camels at the spring. He said, Come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside when I have prepared the house and a place for the camels? So the man came into the house, and Laban unloaded the camels, and gave him straw and fodder for the camels, and water to wash his feet, and the feet of the men who were with him. Then food was set before him to eat, and he said, I will not eat until I have told my errand. He said, Speak on. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become wealthy. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female slaves, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old, and he has given him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred, and get a wife for my son. I said to my master, Perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with you and make your way successful. You shall get a wife for my son, from the kindred from my father's house. Then you will be free from my oath when you come to my kindred, even if they will not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you will only make successful the way I am going. I'm standing here by the spring of water let the young woman who comes out to draw to whom I shall say, please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew. I said to her, please let me drink. She quickly let her down her jaw from her, let down her jar from her shoulder and said, "Drink, and I will also water your camels." Camels. So I drank, and she also watered the camels. Then I asked her, "Whose daughter are you?" She said, "The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him." So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to obtain the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you will deal loyally and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, so that I may turn either to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered, The thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you anything bad or good. Look, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord had spoken. When Abraham's servant heard the words, he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. And the servant brought out jewelry of silver and of gold and garments and gave them to Rebecca. He also gave to her brother and to her mother costly ornaments. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. When they rose in the morning, he said, Send me back to my master. Her brother and her mother said, Let the girl remain with us a while, at least ten days. After that, she may go. But he said to them, Do not delay me. Since the Lord has made my journey successful, let me go, that I may go to my master. They said, We will call the girl and ask her. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will. So they sent away their sister Rebekah and her nurse, along with Abraham's servant and his men. 
And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, May you, our sister, become thousands of myriads. May your offspring gain possession of the gates of their foes. Then Rebekah and her maids rose up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had come from Beer Laha Roy and was settled in the Negeb. Isaac went out in the evening to walk in the field. And looking up, he saw camels coming. And Rebecca looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly from the camel and said to the servant, Who is the man over there walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebecca and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Okay, so that's chapter 24. Um, think about that just a little bit if you had any questions or comments as I was reading that story. I love that story. It's a great, kind of a great love story. It's like you kind of wonder about Rebecca. You know, she's coming to get the water, take it home, do her chores, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's just kind of like, ah, okay. Um, but you know, at the well that day, she becomes betrothed. Uh, she gets some bracelets and a, and a nose ring of pure gold. And she sees this man who's got lots and lots and lots of camels and servants and a whole caravan who have come to basically to find her. So, wow. Talk about feeling special. Um, and but I like the I, I like the idea that she's you know she's spunky enough to say okay sure I'll go with you to this to marry this man I've never met before but he's kin you know he's kin so he can't be all bad okay Lloyd says what is meant by turn either to the right hand or to the left oh well he'll either he will either stay there and wait or he will turn to the other side and leave and go back to his to his um, master, but he wants to take her with him. And so he's, he's waiting for them to say, you know, are you gonna, are you gonna come with me? You're gonna hinder me? You know, am I gonna stay here and wait or what? You know, so that's, and it, I don't think it, it has any indication, although that is language that is used often in the New Testament, you know, that one on the right and one on the left. So you have the good way and the bad way. So one is a way of accomplishment. One is a way of, um, Kind of one is let me just put it this way one is the way of the lord and the other is the something that gets in the way of the lord something that's hindering you from going the way of the lord so um i think there is some of that sense of that as well um if you noted i don't know if you heard it if it ring rang in your ear but in 24 verse 12 he says, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Um, steadfast love, that word chesed, which we see all throughout the Psalms, is probably um, the one Hebrew word that describes the relationship between God and humanity better than any others. It's love, but it's not just love. It's steadfast love, steadfast, faithful um, never ending that kind of relationship that's a forever kind of thing. So that word in itself is a promissory word. It's a vow. It's a covenant in itself. So that word is kind of cool. And it is translated always as steadfast love. And it, it's just peppered throughout this whole story. The other thing is um, they talk about she, the women coming to the well at the end of the day outside the city by the well of water. But then it says, I'm standing here by a spring of water. And that's two ways of describing water. So we may have this idea of the well is a, is a still water where they, it's, the water has been captured for the use for the people who come to draw from the well. But the spring is right there, which is also available. And I think that's kind of a cool thing because you've got um, the stability of the family in the well and the community and the kindred, uh, you know, that's a, it's a good sign that it's there, but it's contained in this place. 
but right next to it, you have the possibility of the spring, which is the bubbling water, the living water. Um, the, the word for spring in the Old Testament is same, the same base of the word that we'll use for spirit a little bit later uh, in the Old Testament. So you've got this kind of, here's one way of life, you know, the domestic life where water serves us. And then there's this life out here, which is kind of exciting and risky and it's moving and it's changing and that kind of thing. And that's where Rebecca has this encounter with the, ser the servant. And you can just imagine that she's might be pulled, you know, do I want to stay where I am, where, I, where I'm safe and what I know what it's all about? Or do I want to go over here to this bubbling spring and find out? what it's like to travel and to meet a man I don't know a man but and yet he's part of my kindred so it can't be all bad kind of thing so that back and forth I think is wonderfully illustrated by the fact that it's not just a well and it's not just a spring it's a place where there is a spring that has a well so those two images I think are kind of fun in this fact that that must have been exactly what was going on um, inside Rebecca as she decided you know whether she was going to do this or whether she was even going to have anything to say about it is, is another thing. So, so skipping over to verse uh, 45, um, I was just thinking about, you know, the reiteration of the story and the whole conversation is told like three different times. You know, I'm going to say this, if she says this, that's the one, da, 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 da. And, but the, the language of it is told over and over and over again. So one of the things that's, that's interesting is this is, this is one of the places where we really see um, when there's a story that is very important to the people and the culture of the people, um, it is usually written out in a way that it is repeated. And in that repetition, you get the idea that this was definitely told, that it was a story that was told around the campfire. It's an oral story that they could repeat, you know, really word for word um, so that they could they would know what was um you know, that the story that they brought forward to tell in this situation um, is, you know, is the same story that's been told over and over and over and over again. Um, a couple of surprising things. Um, when Laban and Bethuel answered that, you know, that they can see that the Lord's hand is in this and, and they're not going to, you know, they don't want to get in the way of that. So they say, um, Look, she's before you, take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord has spoken. So it's kind of like, you know, we're good with this. Okay, Rebecca, pack your bags and hit the road. And you're kind of like, oh, thanks. You know, <laughs> that didn't take long. <laughs> but then when they say, um, can we just have her stay for a little while, for like 10 days, um, so that we can spend time with her and, you know, enjoy her company because chances are um, they're not going to see her again because unless, you know, I don't know how often people just went to visit. Um, so um, let the girl remain with us at least 10 days and after that she may go. Now, part of that could be that they're wanting to delay. Uh, I don't think there's any nefariousness here that they're going to try to, you know, get more for her or whatever but I really think part of this is that they they just want some time to say goodbye um and then the the servant says oh man I really need to get I really now that we know that this is of the Lord I really want to get home and take him you know take her and la la la, la. so they say and here's surprise number one we will call the girl and ask her <laughs> like oh there's a new idea let's ask the person who we're talking about instead of just, you know, selling her off to this, this relative who lives far, far away. Let's ask her what she wants to do. And she says, I'm going to go with them. Uh, surprise number two. So they send her with their blessing, which is a, a nice thing. And then the other surprise in the story comes at the very end of the chapter. Um, when she spies Isaac walking across the field and he sees the camels coming and so she knows that this is the one she's coming towards and takes her veil and covers herself and then the servant tells Isaac all the things that he had done thankfully we don't have to hear the conversation yet again um, but and then Isaac number one brings her into his mother Sarah's tent which I think is just wonderful um, and 
the thing that we're not sure of here is that is this um, is this he's taking her into the tent where Sarah used to live because she just died in the in the passage beforehand. So is this is she still living? And we're kind of going back and forth in time, which we often do in storytelling. Um, you know, like, but before that, <laughs> so um, did he take her into Sarah's tent to meet his mother first, or was she gone? And so then this becomes, this is going to be her tent. This is going to be the, the household mistress's tent. I mean, this will be um, the matriarch's tent. So he, he brings her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he takes her, and she became his wife, and he loved her. This is the first time in a relationship between a man and a woman that the word love is mentioned. So that we finally, in the 25th chapter, or the 24th chapter, we get this idea that a relationship between a husband and a wife is somehow to have love involved. Um, this is not just a, you know, I'm, I'm going to sell you my daughter, I'm going to give you my daughter, or here's a piece of property, you might as well take it with you kind of thing. This is a thing where he actually loved her. And so that's a, that's a wonderful um, beginning of the story here. So you, you pretty much like Isaac because he's gone through the whole ordeal of, you know, perhaps his father taking a knife to him. And you pretty much like Rebecca just because she's funky, she's willing to risk all kinds of stuff and try something new. And, uh, and so you got a little bit of a picture of who these people are, it, of Isaac and Sarah, as they move uh, into this relationship together. So I don't see any questions. So, oh, Fiddler on the Roof, do you love me? <laughs> do I what? <laughs> yeah, that's great. But um, I, that always, it always just kind of tickles me that, you know, Adam and Eve, that there was nothing about love between them. And then we go on and on and on and on. And even Abraham and Sarah, who were already married when we, when we first come upon them, um, I don't believe there's anything in there about the fact that they, that they loved each other. So uh, this is kind of the first time. So, Abraham, let's, I'm going to read just a little bit ahead. Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimron, Jokshan, Midan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan was the father of Sheb and Dedan. The sons of Dedan were Asherim, Letushim, and Leumim. The sons of Midian were Epha, Epher, Hanak, Abida, and Elda. All these were the children of Keturah. Abraham gave all he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living, and he sent them away from his son Isaac, eastward to the east country. So um, the question that we were talking about where, you know, Isaac and Ishmael are parted, and Ishmael goes out into the desert with Hagar, um, here we have maybe Abraham has learned a little bit um, and does not want that kind of uh, tearing apart of his children. So when he takes another wife um, and she bears him all these children and grand who bring him grandchildren, um, he ha he moves them away from Isaac and Rebecca so that Isaac and Rebecca can have um, the primacy of the son who is the heir. You know, which I think is kind of a nice thing for him to do. This is the length of Abraham's life, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, son of Zohar the Hittite, east of Mamre, the field that Abraham purchased from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with his wife, Sarah. After the death of Abraham, God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac settled at Beir Lahai Roy. Now, interesting, we have here a name of a person that we thought might have died under the tree without Hagar, his mother, watching. But it says his sons, Isaac and Ishmael buried him. 
So whether they were speaking, whether they were collaborating on this funeral or not, they were both present when Abraham died. Um, not both present, or at least we don't know, but it's not mentioned that, that Ishmael was there when Sarah died. That would be asking a lot. Um, but so we, A, know that Ishmael did not die, and B, that he still has contact um, with the family so that when his father dies, he's there to be uh, present at the burial. So that's, that's kind of a nice thing. But it will get better about that. Now we have a story about Ishmael's descendants. These are the descendants of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's slave girl, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael, named in the order of their birth. Nebaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, Adbil, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tema, Jetur, Nafish, and Kedima. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their encampments, twelve princes according to their tribes. This is the length of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. He breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They settled from Havilah to Shur, which is opposite Egypt in the direction of Assyria. He settled down alongside of all of his people. So we know that Ishmael grew and thrived and had descendants of his own um, and apparently at some point, um, you know, there's a, there is a, a, a dynasty going on even as the patriarchy of Judaism is forming, the patriarchy of Islam is forming as well. Now, Islam won't come into this history until much, much later, but the descendants of Ishmael are the Arabs and the, those who predominantly are the Muslim community. But they also had 12 princes or 12 basic tribes, um, which would not be unusual if he was raised in a Jewish household or in a, it's going to become the people of Israel. Um, so just some, again, some interesting parallels, some interesting um, echoes and layers Ishmael, 12 sons down the road, Jacob, 12 sons <laughs> down the road, Jesus, 12 disciples. Yeah, 12 is a number for a minion, and that is the foundation of, of creating a community synagogue. So, um, so there you have it. This is just going on and on and on, and, uh, and there's a structure to it um, that is almost as if God had something in mind here as it was unfolding. So these are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. And when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game but Rebecca loved Jacob. Okay, just, <clears throat> um, I was going to tell you the name. Um, we don't have a, da, 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 da. the Hebrew words for red and hairy play on the names Edom and Seir, where Esau settled. The name Jacob plays on the Hebrew words for heal and supplant or replace. Um, or some people kid about um, Jacob being the the heel grabber, 
<laughs> so he was going to, and part of it was he was, he was tagging along. It was like he was grabbing on to Esau's coat strings or apron strings um, so that he could go along the same path. So Esau is the, you know, he's cutting the, cutting the way through the forest and clearing the fields so that Jacob's life will be easier. And apparently that's kind of how it goes all the way through. So, um, so here again, here this, when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau. So father loves firstborn because he was fond of game but Rebecca loved Jacob, so mother and second born. Um, there's all kinds of things that come out of this story as far as parents and children and who gets the, the favored status and who, and sometimes that is for, you know, for the male, it would be obvious if the firstborn would be the most favored. But then you have the story of Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac. So Ishmael may have been favored, but once Isaac was born, he got, you know, he got sent out into the desert. So parents and children and how they connect, um, there's some interesting stuff on that that's been written about the relationships between fathers and sons throughout the patriarchy. Okay, so finally, once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff for I am famished. Therefore, he was called Edom, which means red. Okay. Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So Esau swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. In other words, Esau was the kind of guy who having, you know, the flocks and the fields and all the things that were Isaac's um, just didn't make any difference to him at all. He didn't care. Um, so he gives it up for a bowl of soup and a piece of bread and, you know, and the rest is history. <laughs> so, okay. So we're going to stop there for, uh, we'll start next time on chapter 26. So that will be 930. And we'll talk, and then we move ahead in the patriarch. Um, hello, Roxana. Because he loved game, what does that mean? Oh, um, game like wild animals. He, he liked to go hunting, and he was always bringing home, um, you know, whatever, whatever kind of animal he went out to hunt. So he was a, he was a woodsman. He was a wild man. Um, you know, he just liked to be out in nature and be with the wild things and live off the land. So the inheritance of domesticity and flocks uh, basically had no um, appeal to him. So when Jacob says, you know, I'll give you a bowl of soup and some bread, that's, that's what happened. So, oh, good. Thanks for the thumbs up. I like to know that I answered the questions. <laughs> okay, so that's it for today. Thanks for being with me. I appreciate you all taking the time. And for those of you who will watch after uh, um, On Demand, hello, goodbye. Uh, enjoy the read and uh, take a look. If you want to take a look ahead, feel free. But now we're moving into this is the, the, the line of Abraham which we call the patriarchy. Um, sometimes we call the patriarchs and matriarchs, but you know, we got, so we start with Abraham and Sarah who God calls. And then we've got, you know, the sons that come down and it comes, you know, got two sons, we got two sons, we got two, it's going to go on and on and on that way for a little while until we get to um, Joseph and his brothers where there will be not only two, but 12. So, um, so have a wonderful day. Enjoy the story. We're getting into some of the, the great stories of Genesis. And, uh, um, you know, so if you want to read ahead and have questions ready, please go ahead. But I will continue to read because um, I keep getting comments and it, it just amazes me. But it would be I would think it would be absolutely true that as grownups, we rarely have someone read to us a story. So it's it's a pleasure to be able to be the story reader or the storyteller for you, especially to the parts of this story that you may not have um,
kind of focused in on before, like most people don't know um, the result of Ishmael once he went out into the desert with Hagar. They just assume he died, and that just wasn't the case. But you got to keep reading the story to find out what happened. Well, whatever happened to Ishmael? Well, here you go. And we're going to see him again as well. So we'll get a little bit more on Ishmael later in Genesis. So have a wonderful day. I will see you next week. For those of you who are um, walking, waking up white with me on Thursday nights, our book on uh, anti-racism, you're welcome to drop in. If you'd like to drop in at any time, uh, you just need to get the, the Zoom code from me. So send me an email or a text and I'll send that out to you. We meet on Thursdays at 7. So I'll see you. Um, God bless you during the rest of your week and uh, hope I, you will see me on Sunday and I'll feel you in the crowd. God's blessings. See you later.